you would, turn in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. I know you may have shown up today hoping that we were going to be back in Revelation. And that, that is coming. Next Sunday we'll be back in Revelation 19. We just have a few chapters left before we finish that out. The first passage that we're going to look at returning to Revelation 19 is the rider on a white horse. Our Lord Jesus Christ returning to earth in the second advent, the second coming. But since today is still kind of the holiday and it's January the 1st, I wanted us to do a somewhat of a different, a different type of, of sermon. A sermon this morning to just uh, uh, build up the church and get us reflecting upon uh, who we are and what we're about. And hopefully today, although it will be a little bit unique to what uh, my normal preaching is, uh, will be a blessing to you. It's 2023. Happy New Year to you all. I am tired this morning. It's hard to stay up that late when you're 43 years old and then wake up the next morning and get going. I'm feeling it. I think I need a nap this afternoon. But it is neat to think that we are just hours in to this 2023. I remember being a kid in the 80s and us wondering what it was going to be like when we hit the 2000s. I remember us discussing whether there would be flying cars in the year 2000. Some of you all remember that. Well, we are way past that, and we've blown the year 2000 away. And we're 23 years into this millennium, and God has designed it where the first few hours of this year would be here, and that's a good thing. Tired, busy, distracted as we are because of the, the holiday season being full, there still is something very special that you and I are here. I was praying this morning that this very thing right now would be an example and a picture for the rest of our year. Christ first, God first. Jesus says in Matthew 6 to seek first the kingdom of God. And may this, what we're doing right now, be an example of that. You and I did not make it very far in 2023 before we said, let's get to church. Let's hear the word of God. Let's let God's church point me to my Savior, Jesus. And that's a good thing. We didn't plan that. It just so happens that today is a Sunday just like Christmas, and I told you on Christmas morning, and it's the same for today. This will not happen again for 11 years. It will be 2034 the next time January 1 is on a Sunday. So it's good for us to be here. May God use the effort and the emphasis of church in the early morning hours of a new year to set our hearts upon that. I hope that you want that. I hope that you're desiring that. And I hope that's the very reason why you're here today. We can get overboard if we aren't careful with New Year's resolutions and plans and changes and all the things that we're going to do differently. And Sometimes that is a little overzealous. We buy new journals and new notebooks and new calendars and we set out all of these plans only to know that here within two weeks we will have forgotten all of that. So this morning I don't want to push you to set some goals and I don't want to challenge you to make resolution, but I do want to set before you some priorities. What you do with the priorities is, is up to you, but I do want to set before you this day Three priorities for you and for us in this new year. Now, you know what priorities are, right? They're the things that are more important. There are lots of things to do. We know that. The new year hits us hard, and we see it coming quickly, and there's a lot that we need to do already, right? And we're feeling that. What day this week are you going to take down the Christmas decorations, and every moment that you put that off, you're now behind. Because school starts Wednesday and the schedule is jam-packed starting January 4th for us. I'll probably put off the Christmas decorations and not do it these next two days and then be stressed out about it every day into this next week. 
priorities are, okay, what is most important? Should we do this or should we do this? We got options. Well, churches do too. And church people do too. So today I want to lay before you three priorities for us and for you in this new year. I want us to look at this passage in Hebrews 10 to start off and then conclude with these three priorities. Read with me, if you will, from Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, In full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is a familiar passage to Bible readers and for churchgoers. It's like the biggest passage that we talk about on why church attendance is important. That's not the emphasis that I want to make here today. The emphasis that I'm wanting us to see today is how important it is for believers to be committed to each other. Let me say that again. How important it is for believers to be committed to each other. God unquestionably teaches this. If we are to be believers of the Bible and the Savior Jesus of the Bible, then we are to understand that he wants us to have committed relationships with each other. There is no question about that. There is no debating that. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that we have to have the same interests. The Bible doesn't teach that we have to have the same hobbies and likes and spend all of our free time in the same way. The Bible doesn't teach that we have to spend our downtime together. It doesn't. We can be so very different. We can have all kinds of differences about us and yet value, deeply value each other. Because the Bible teaches that staying close to God in his grace and mercy works through close relationships that agree on that. We need each other. Notice the emphasis here. It's clearly Jesus, right? We have confidence by the blood of Jesus. He's given us a new and living way. He opened it for us through the curtain. That's his flesh. He is a great priest over the house of God. It's it's clearly all about Jesus here. There's no questioning that. You're not going to get a January 1 moral pep talk today. I'm not here to give you a motivational speech. And may God really, really, really prevent that this morning. And may you not hear it as that this morning. May we be pointed to Christ. May we see that there is a person that came from heaven in the advent and served us well, taught us well. And then gave his life, was crucified, died, hung on a cross, punished, spilt his blood, gave his blood for us. May we know that that and that alone is the only way that we will be right with God, that we will have confidence before God. And confidence before God is not this out of place, misplaced, weird feeling that we're trying to give ourselves. It's a biblical concept. I wouldn't have even thought of that, but the Bible teaches it. That we have confidence to go boldly before the throne of grace. That's also in Hebrews. Confidence is a Bible word, and the confidence comes not from our ability, not from who we are, but rather from Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And for the person that believes, hopes, trusts, casts all of their hopes on the work of Christ, there is confidence, there is security, there is foundation, there is stability. The Bible wants us to see this, and that's the emphasis this morning, and that is exactly where all believers in churches should start in a new year on January 1. But from there, this passage totally shows us the emphasis of needing each other. In verse 22, 
it says, let us. Does everybody see that? If we're not careful, Christianity will be reduced into, here's what I need to do. I've had several people talk to me over the past couple days about some New Year's resolutions around their faith. That's good. I was glad. Somebody told me about a new journal that they got. Lots of people told me about some new books that they've gotten they're reading. Several people have brought up to me how they're going to try to read the Bible better this year and be involved in church more this year. Had somebody tell me they're going to be involved in a Thursday morning ladies Bible study this year. They had not done that before. There's a lot of that. But New Year's resolutions and goals for your spiritual life almost always are me, 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 and I, I, I. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. I want you to see this morning how much it is us, us, us. Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. With our hearts, so easily could have said, I'm going to draw nearer to God this year. And I want my heart to be in a good place. That's not what the Bible says. Now, it's certainly true, but the Bible wants you to think about everything I do in my spiritual life. By walking with the Lord Jesus, I need to do it with other people. This world's too big, this world's too heavy, the devil's too real, sin is too deceptive for me to try to do this in isolation. I need to hear the plurality of this passage. Jump down to verse 23. Totally different thing. Let us. There it is again. That's our second let us. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Again, this is not a motivational speech about, hey, you just got to have hope. You just got to keep believing. I had all types of issues over the past month at my home. I'm a homeowner now, and stuff always comes up. And I go over to the hardware store begging and begging for them to tell me what to do because I'm so not a handyman. I don't know how to fix things. And as I was walking out, I asked the guy, wish me luck, man. I hope I can get this right. And he said, you just got to believe. I kind of like that. But it didn't really make sense to me. Believe what? Believe that I can do it? I know I can't do it. I, I mean, I, I can't wait for somebody to come and help. And he said, you just got to believe. See, sometimes we talk to ourselves like that even with Christianity. Hey, you just, you just got to keep believing, man. If you'll just believe enough on your own, then, then God might do something. He might be a lucky enough rabbit's foot that you believe in strong enough is going to turn God into doing something good for you. That's so not what the Bible is teaching us. I mean, it's, it's like a totally other end of the spectrum. When the Bible says keep believing, it's not saying keep believing for things to go better. It's saying keep believing that the blood of Jesus has brought you close to God and you should have all the confidence in the world that God is your God. And that you are his child. And that no matter what, you're secure in his hand. And you may never become a handyman with all the faith in the world. But you can believe in him. And if you're not going to become a handyman, well, just keep trying or ask for help. Those are the options. But it's not like belief spins you into a handyman. That's not it. But there is this idea here of being together. Believing together. Verse 23 says that we have hope together. It's our hope. And we need to hold fast to that together. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. So you see, let us. Well, then now look at verse 24. It's three verses in a row. And all three of them say, let us. Verse 24. And let us consider... How to stir up one another to love and good works. The idea here is, what can my faith do to build up other people? 
How can I be more spiritual in this new year, trusting in Christ? How as a Christian this year can my life stir up people and stir is such a good word? You know what it is to stir stuff up? Val asked me to make some pink lemonade recently. Just a real simple one where no sugar's involved. You literally just screw that cap off, measure it on the, you know, they even got the measuring thing on the cap. Y'all know that one. You put it in there. It's literally just powder, water, and stir it. And as soon as I finished the whole gallon, I knew that I had messed up. It was so weak. It was so weak. It was watered down. And you get to the bottom of your cup, and there's powder in the bottom of your cup. Like, how, how do you mess that up? I don't know, but I did. It was some weak stuff. But stirring is doing that until all that's sitting down there not doing its job, not accomplishing its purpose, not getting in the mix, not making the lemonade be the lemonade, stirring it up until it does. And the Bible teaches You ought to be considering how your faith in Christ, how your unwavering hope in the faithful God that keeps his promises, how you can stir up us. That's what the Bible teaches. That is a beautiful goal for 2023. That is a beautiful New Year's resolution. Notice, let us draw near, verse 22. Let us hold fast, verse 23. Let us consider, verse 24. Notice that this is clearly about a group of people that are trusting in Christ together. In our scripture reading passage, Matt read for us from 1 John 3. It's the same idea from a different author. I want to read that to you again. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Notice how absolutely essential it is that these relationships are connected to each other. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. It is true that we can lay down our lives and sacrifice for the world around us and for the unbelieving people in our lives. And the Bible does teach that in other places. It's not what it's teaching here. Here it's teaching that the brothers and sisters in Christ who have relationship together ought to be laying down their lives for each other. Church relationships. Verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In other words, the Bible is expecting here that we are aware of the needs around us. We're aware of the needs among church people and church family. It is proximity. It is from uh, being involved with announcements and involved with sharing, involved in prayer meetings, and involved in what's going on in each other's lives that we would become aware of this. How else could we? Verse 18. He gives this clear little, little short verse, but this clear summary. Little children, let us not love in word or talk but in deed and in truth. You may make the case that 2023 for America, I I don't know about the rest of the world throughout all of history, they've been through some hard times, the church has throughout the year. But it sure seems that 2023 will be the most important year in the history of our country for Christians to be real Christians. Because what's happened through COVID is that so many people are deciding, I don't really think I am Christian. So many people. So many people are now deciding, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not a church person. I'm not so sure that I believe the Bible. I'm not so sure that I'm a Christian, actually. So when you hear First John say, hey, enough of talk. Enough of saying the right things. Let us be the ones in deed and in truth are the real thing. Let us be the ones that say, here's what my faith looks like. What does this say? And then let me get up off my knees and go try to walk in it. That's Christianity. 
In today's passage, just one of many in this big book, next week will be Revelation 19, but today's passage is Hebrews 10, and the emphasis here is us, 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 us. But the emphasis upon us comes from this incredible confidence in the work of Christ. Jesus' blood has brought us near to God. We are forgiven of our sins. And we have a perspective upon life. We have a perspective on who we are. We have a perspective on how God wants us to be that has come from him. Church, may we believe in Jesus And may believing in Jesus instruct us to value these faithful relationships. Let me say that again. Church, may we believe in Jesus. And may believing in Jesus cause us to value these relationships. So, three priorities. Okay? In light of this... In light of this passage, in light of the truth, in light of Jesus and the confidence that we have for him, three priorities for you and for us in this new year. Number one, worship. May your faith be producing worship. May you think about your faith and understand your faith as worship. We're going to church to worship God. We're living by faith every day of our lives as worship to God. May worship get you thinking about the glory of God. Is God glorified in who we are and what we're doing? Is God pleased in who we are and what we're doing? Is God praised in who we are and what we're doing? Is he valued? Is is his worth being understood? Is God worshiped? Let's just go ahead and admit right now and confess right now back to that 1 John 3 passage that when we only do it through talk and not from the right heart, we're not really in deed and in truth, it's not according to his word, that there's a whole lot of religious life, there's a whole lot of spirituality, there's a whole lot of this or that, there's a whole lot of church life even that is not worship. There is. May we confess that. And may we say, starting today, moving forward, and not be that. May we be worshipers of the one true and living God. As you set yourself toward worship, you are a worshiper of God. That's what you do. You're a worshiper of God with other people. That's why we come to church. May we then value the gathering. Clearly, that's an emphasis here, valuing the gathering. May that be a priority for you in this new year, that gathering with the church is a priority to you. Life is busy and our schedules are full. And if you're not careful, lots of things will get in the way of church. I know that. We have soccer tournaments on Sundays. We've got birthday parties on Sunday mornings. We've got so many things that get in the way. I know. And it takes a commitment. It takes a prioritizing to say, we're going to be involved. We're going to be involved with our church that worships together. I don't know what you need to do to prioritize worship, but I want you to hear this morning to prioritizing worship. For some of us, it's, it's Sunday morning. We've been walking through Revelation, and Revelation answers so many questions that people are asking. Revelation deals with so many of things that people talk about wrongly, wrongly, wrongly all the time with Christianity. Revelation addresses so many of the things that the guys on TV are totally wrong about because they don't actually read and study the Bible. Revelation does that, and if you are here to hear that and you want to hear that, you will be growing in what the Bible actually teaches. For some, it may be getting in a Sunday school class or a small group. For some, it may be looking for a Bible study to be involved with here. For some, it may be our Wednesday nights where there's more of an emphasis on prayer, although there is Bible study there. For some people, it may be a commitment to taking the Lord's Supper. We do it once a month. We do it the first Sunday of the month. If I were to ask how many times in 2022 did you take the Lord's Supper, we served it 12 times. How many times did you take it? And the Bible teaches us that this is an incredible, like a monumental moment when the church gathers to see that there are other people out there saying, this bread represents the body of Christ, the one that came from heaven and lived a life and never sinned and died on the cross. And when he hung on the cross, he spilt his blood. He really died. Blood ran out on the cross, and that drink represents his blood. And there are other people around here believing That the body and blood of Christ are our only hope of eternal life. 
And we take that together because Jesus taught us to. It is strong to take the Lord's Supper. We're doing it today. May you just commit to that. May you check the schedule. May you read the emails. May you look at the bulletin and say, okay, when are we taking it in February? Today's January 1. I don't know what date we're taking it in February. It's it's the first Sunday. But may you mark that one off and say, we're not going to miss it. May you be thinking about taking it and taking it rightly. This is a commitment to worship. Worship is what we do. We worship God. But let us remember that it is in response to what he has done. That's clear in this Hebrews 10 passage. Before you get to all the let us's, it's about the blood of Jesus and the work of Jesus and the great high priest that we have. A priest is one that goes to God on our behalf. So worship is what we do. We're here today to worship him. We only worship him as a response to what he has done. Jesus has done what we cannot do. Jesus has taken the punishment for our sins. Jesus has died in our place. He's died for our death. And Jesus has overcome it, and he has risen, and he lives. And he lives now forever. It's because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done that we are worshipers. With that being said, we understand that doing things for God, whatever that might be, may or may not be worship. It's spiritual. It's by faith. It's from the heart. It's like the wind. And so if God is worship, it depends on where our focus is and where our hearts are. So we need to check our hearts. And what better time to do that than Sunday morning January the 1st. Are you a God worshiper? Is God worshipped in your heart and life? Are we worshiping God here today? Church, in 2023, may it be a priority of ours, a priority of yours, a priority of our church and of your faith that we worship. We worship daily, walking by faith, believing God and his gospel. And we worship together when we consistently gather with commitment to worship God together. That's number one, worship. Number two, is work. Work. We know that we cannot work our way to heaven. The Bible is always pointing this out. To be a Bible reader is to know you cannot work your way to heaven. That's one of the more easier ways to recognize churches and denominations and religions that don't really understand the gospel and aren't really committed to the Bible when they teach you that you can work your way to heaven because the Bible so often says that you can't. We know that we cannot earn anything with God. He is our gracious God and Savior. God is not our contractual boss. It's not Old Covenant where if you do this, God will do this. That's not what we are living under. We don't work to get anything from God. We work because he has given us everything. We work because of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2 is just one of the places that speaks directly to this. It says, not by works. It says you're saved by grace. It says it's a gift of God. It says it's not by works so that nobody can boast. It says all of that. We are to know that and believe that. But that doesn't mean we become lazy it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that we don't do things. It means that we work, because the Bible does teach us to work hard. The very next verse, and this is very well written, this is good writing in Ephesians 2 from the Apostle Paul. 8 and 9 is where it says, you can't earn it, not by works, it's by grace, it's a gift. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You memorize that early on in church. But the very next verse, literally verse 10 says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. 
So the Bible is teaching us to work and be hard workers. But to understand why we work and where our work comes from, it's so healthy to get this right. It's so beautiful to get this right. Not trying to earn it. Not working to get anything, but working because we have everything. Not working for the victory, but working from the victory. Not working for the W, but from the W. And W meaning win. This is a beautiful thing. In 2023, I want you to prioritize work. Now, all of our lives are different. We're at different places and different schedules. So we're not ever to look around and, and, and try to work the same. We don't compare ourselves to each other. We walk by faith. We live the lives that God has set out for us to do. And surely you know that, right? The comparison game that is eating up so many of your loved ones and the comparison game that's eating up so many of people that are on social media is, is not what Christians are to be doing. We set our eyes on heaven, we follow Christ, and from there we determine with, with good reason what we can do and what we can't do. We can't all work the same. Some of you all have so much going on with babies and children, actually a lot of you all have so much going on with babies and children, that there's not a lot of time for you to work, and we get that. Don't, be, don't feel guilty that you're not doing something else. We understand that. Stay your lane, do what you do, trust the Lord and understand that. But it is a priority of believers and of the church that we are to be working and doing good works and hard working. That we are to give ourselves. That our time is short. That there's an urgency here in living for God and wanting to make a difference and wanting to contribute. This has become, rather without plan, this has become somewhat of a characteristic of our church. And I'm thankful for that. I think it's true that we are a hardworking church. May it be that we're a church of good works. We won't be the judge of that. But we pray that we are a church filled with good works. May we desire on some levels that our reputation in our homes and on our streets and in the people around us and in this community and those that just live around the South louisville Fairdale area, that we are hardworking people, that we are a people filled with good works, that we are people ready and eager to do whatever we can. That we would do exactly what 1 John 3 says that we read. That we would recognize that somebody has needs in our midst. And we would say, how can we meet those? What can we do? If I have a shirt and somebody needs a shirt, maybe may I be wanting to give somebody that shirt. If I have food and somebody needs some food, may we be wanting to give somebody that food. And the Bible teaches us this is how we should be and that takes effort. And so we see hard work. There are so many ways in a church for you to be working and things for you to do. In a church like ours where we have one full-time employee and then about eight to ten other part-time employees, nearly everything that this church does is from people that volunteer and give of themselves. I want to throw out just a couple of numbers to get you thinking. In 2022... Our church served over 2,000 hot meals out of our kitchen. Over 2,000 hot meals out of our kitchen. That is Wednesday night dinners. That is um, uh, funeral meals, bereavement type stuff. And that is feeding local schools and feeding local sports teams. Over 2,000 of those. Oven on, stove on. Dishes to be washed, forks to clean up, tables to be wiped, floor to be swept, trash to be taken out. Over 2,000 of those in 2022. As far as I know of, nobody was paid to do any of it. We've been rejoicing now for a couple years about how many babies we've had. In the last two years, I think we've had over 30 babies born in our church. That's a good thing. And we often hear it during the church service of kids crying out. We're reminded of that good thing. But we provide nursery during Sunday school. We provide, vers we provide nursery during church right now. Provide nursery on Sunday nights during church. We provide nursery on Wednesday nights during church. 
On a weekly basis, there are 15 to 20 kids or babies in our nursery. On a regular basis, we have 35 to 40 babies registered in there. This requires 10 to 12 adult volunteers every week. The team of people that volunteer in the nursery is about 45 volunteers. All of that brings us to our church changed over 500 diapers in 2022. That's a lot of poop. That's a lot of work. And every time you change a diaper, the trash has to be taken out. A lot of effort there. A lot of people sacrificing to make sure we can do this. A lot of moms sitting here right now, somewhat at ease for this quick hour because somebody down there is working hard. But we also took a big step with our food pantry this year. We have the building. It's an impressive building, and we're proud of it, and we are rejoicing and thanking God that we have it. In 2022 alone, just last year, we passed out over 15,000 food boxes. That doesn't count the sack of potatoes or the head of cabbage or whatever else we were giving out. In 2022, we distributed over, listen to this, we distributed over 250,000 pounds of food. And these are not exaggerated numbers. Once a week, we get truckloads, multiple truckloads, often two at a time, that have anywhere from 10 to 20,000 pounds of food. And volunteers here to pass it out. Every week, we get four to 5,000 pounds of food just on a pickup truck or a box truck that we're renting. That's a lot of work. If you've never tried to lift one of those giant bags of cabbage, they're heavy. It's hard for me to pick up one of those giant bags of cabbage. They're heavy. It's a lot of work. And all of that is to say, and that's just a few things. That's the nursery, that's the kitchen, and that's the food pantry. And there's so much else that goes on in the life of the church. So that we can share the gospel with people. That's not an end in and of itself. That's a ways and a means to the end of talking to people about Jesus. So many times while we're serving dinners, we're talking to them about Jesus. So many times as we're passing out food, we're talking to them about Jesus. And so many times when people are down there working in the nursery, there's somebody here talking to them about Jesus. We work hard because we want our lives to count. And we want people to know Jesus. But in case we get sideways on that and we think that working is what it's all about, it's good for us to remind ourselves that hard work is a beautiful thing and we admire good work ethic, but we also know that there are lots of unhealthy work environments, aren't there? You've heard of toxic work environments. You've heard of bad at attitudes and bitterness and jealousy and frustration, and you've, you've certainly heard of... Uh, too many chiefs, not enough Indians, or too many Indians, not enough chiefs, however that goes, getting in each other's way. It's possible that we got a lot going on here, and it's really not getting us anywhere, right? It's possible that we're all just busybodies over here, and God's not worshipped. The whole point of work is worship. The point of work, by faith is never to earn anything. The point of work by faith is worship. May we never miss that. Just as much as we're familiar with toxic work environments, where work is a drag to you, it's bad for your health, you hate being there, you hate the people you work with, you hate the people beside you, you hate to go in, you, you can't wait to get off, it's so negative for your life. The opposite is true as well. Where working together and alongside other people lifts you up. You're glad to be there. Brothers and sisters in Christ, working together by faith, not competing, but serving, is so inspiring and uplifting. When you know the person beside you is worshiping from a pure heart, it is good for you. Knowing that you are a part of a bigger cause and a bigger purpose is so refreshing and it is so fulfilling. 
How many times have we been here on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and see people working hard, even sweating through their clothes and hearing laughter and joy and high fives and encouragement over prayer because we know the bigger reason. Church, in 2023, would you prioritize work? Would you look around and see how can you serve the Lord with gladness? That comes from Psalm 100 that we memorized in 2022. Serve the Lord with gladness. Would you be proud of your church that we're a hardworking church? But would you help us all remember together that we're not here to earn anything? Let us, let us, let us, let us, let us work hard together. And let us, let us, let us, let us never think that we're earning something. May we think our our work is worship. Number one, may we prioritize worship. Number two, may we prioritize work. And then lastly, number three, may we prioritize war. W-A-R, war. There may be a time for me to preach on war, but it's not today. By war, I mean praying. I like using war with prayer because it's common to hear people say prayer warriors, right? You've heard of that. They're my prayer warrior. They're a prayer warrior. It's somebody that prays a lot. It's somebody that commits to pray and, and, and sticks to prayer and somebody who understands the value of praying. Church, worship and work are important, but praying is too. A prayer ministry in a church is one of the most important works. In our passage in Hebrews 10, while verses 24 and 25 refer to all things that happen in a church gathering, right? Don't neglect it. Stir each other up. You need to encourage each other. You need to keep looking to the return of Christ. All that's there in Hebrews 10. It refers to everything that is a part of the church's gathering. It definitely refers to a church's commitment to meet and pray together. As, as, as pastors, we want so much for, for every one of you to feel and to get and to embrace that, 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 that praying for each other and praying as a believer is not what the really spiritual do. It's not what the good ones do. It's not what the big Christians do or the solid Christians do. Everybody needs to be praying. There's no such thing as good prayers and bad prayers The Bible teaches us in all types of passages, you don't have to pray for a long time. You don't have to be good at praying. You have to have certain words. You have to bow your heart before God and cry out to him. The Bible says you don't even have to do it out loud. He understands. But we need to be a praying people. It's our desire that in 2023 that it would be a huge priority for you and for us that we are a praying church, that we pray for each other. That we understand love, support, and encourage each other by praying for each other. Being a part of that is such a real aspect of living out our faith and our church family life together. As believers, we feel the emotions of life, and we should. Encouragement and discouragement are real parts of the Christian life. They are. Because we're trusting in God, our Father in heaven, we're often wondering, why is God doing the things in my life that he's doing? And that creates emotion. To be a believer is to have your emotions stirred. Now, I know that some people are more emotional than others, but we're often thinking about why. So in part, what happens in our faith is we begin to care about the emotions that we're experiencing, and we begin to care about the emotions that other people are experiencing. And that concern, you might even say, that burden matters to us. And the best way to deal with it, not the only way, but the best way to deal with it is to sincerely, genuinely pray for each other. In a church where we're caring about each other, This is a non-stop cycle. This is daily. This is 24-7. Our phones do not stop with pray for this, pray for this. Here's what's going on. Pray for this. There's all sorts of struggles. There are all sorts of things of emotion in the lives of believers, and that's good. But we need to be praying. Our church has a lot of opportunities to help you grow in praying. We have worked hard to create lots of prayer avenues. 
There's a prayer meeting on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. There's a prayer meeting on Wednesday, every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There's a prayer meeting for men on Saturday mornings once a month. There's a prayer meeting for ladies on Saturday mornings once a month. There's lots of prayers. Lots of times to pray. We also have a prayer list that we keep up regularly. We could get that to you. We also now have a prayer team where we are hoping that you will find one hour a week that will just be your time. Not that you pray for an, a, an hour in the week, but that's, that's, that's your time. We have this big, whole, awesome chart downstairs, and there are open slots on it. We would love for you to pick one of those. Where Tuesdays at 4 o'clock or Thursdays at 6 a.m., you're going to pray for the church or anything that we reach out and ask you to pray for. It's a beautiful thing that we've started where 24-7 there is always somebody in our church that's praying. It's awesome. And so this communication that happens, pray for this, pray for this, pray for this, pray for this. Hey, I'm about to walk into this meeting and share the gospel. I'm meeting with my friend and we're going to talk about Jesus. He's been asking me questions. Hey, I've got a kid at school that's been asking me questions about how do I get forgiven of my sins. Pray for this. Next thing you know, there's people are praying and praying and praying and praying. We want you to be involved in that. We want to challenge you that your Christian life and your faith and your church life would not be absent of praying, but it would be a priority of your faith that you're a praying person. And in being a praying person, that you would then tie it in to your church involvement so that you're praying for us and that we're praying for you. Three priorities for you and for us in the new year. Look back to Hebrews chapter 10. Look at how this passage ends. Verse 24 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more As you see the day drawing near. The day drawing near refers to the end. Refers to the return of Christ. Which Revelation has thrust us to. Nothing. Will help shape your priorities more. Than reminding yourself that you're going to one day stand before God. Nothing. Will help you prioritize your life more. Than knowing that soon one day soon you're going to meet Christ. It makes the meaningless stuff not very important. And it makes the big stuff very important. Church in 2023, let's get our priorities right. Worship our Savior. Work for our Savior. Go to war in prayer for our Savior. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we can start our year here. And we can start by looking to your word in this encouraging passage in Hebrews 10. Father, we pray that you would help us to set our priorities right. God, help us to be able to identify what what needs to change, what needs to get better. Help us need to identify that which is really important and that which is not that very important. And then, God, by faith and by obedience and by confidence, God, may we structure our lives around our priorities. Father, we pray that you'd be worshipped through us together this year. Dear God, we pray that we would work hard for you together this year. And dear God, we pray that we would pray faithfully together this year. Because Jesus is worthy and because he's coming soon. Because the day is drawing near. And those things are valuable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time we're going to take the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask those guys that are going to...